The book of Colossians is another of Paul's prison letters written from Rome. Paul wanted the believers in Colossae to be firm in their understanding that Jesus alone is at the head of all churches. Paul's surroundings never interfered with his ability to communicate that Jesus Christ brings true freedom. I was just looking at all of you shaking hands and hugging. The cameras were panning, and it says, it's great to see you. Welcome back to the Bible from 30,000 feet. And I'll tell you, I have, I have really missed this um, study this last month. It's been great all that we've done for necessary reasons, but it's really great to be back to the meat of the Word, the book of Colossians. Now, because we've taken a little over a month off in the Bible from 30K, it afforded me a chance to really get into this book. So I was able to read through Colossians uh, probably at least 16 times, just over and over and over and over again and just really understand it afresh. It's a book that, because I did that, means a lot to me. And I'll say this, the book of Colossians is one of those messages that has certain truths in it that is desperately needed today. Because of the tendency today, as I would say in every age, since it was a tendency back then to get off track, to get off center, to swerve toward other emphases. It's always a danger for God's people to get off of what is most important and get sidetracked on important issues that aren't the most important issues. And they can take precedence over that which is all important, as we'll see tonight. I remember when I was in college, which was at least 10 years ago, Way, way over that. And I would uh, go visit my parents on weekends from college. It was an internship in radiology. And I'd drive from the hospital in San Bernardino to my parents' house about an hour away. And the week had sometimes been so laborious and taxing with work and study that I would find myself driving on the freeway, falling asleep, swerving off, only to be caught by those little markers that are little bumps. So your tires started going, and I'd wake up. And it's a good thing, because on the other side of those bumps was at least a 30-foot drop. And uh, so it, it just showed me, hey, stay awake so that you can get to your destination. And I see that as a real issue then, 2,000 years ago, when this was written, and today. Now, the dominant theme of this book is to keep Jesus Christ dead center, right in the middle of your life. For a Christian, he is it. He is everything. He is the pinnacle. Nothing else matters as much as him. That cannot be overstated, and Paul certainly states it over and over again in this letter. Because there's winds of doctrine that blow from time to time. There's other voices out there telling me, well, it's good that you have Jesus Christ, but you need more than him. It's not quite enough. It's great that you're a Christian, but if you only experienced what we have experienced in our group, or if you only had the special knowledge that we have in this other group, you'd be so much further ahead than you are now. And I've discovered from reading Colossians that it's not some new experience or some new revelation. What I need is uh, a fresh experience of the old revelation, of the most important revelation, which is Christ. In fact, what Paul would say is this, and we'll amplify it as we go through it tonight. If you have Jesus Christ, you have it all. You don't need anything else. And sometimes we look for something new. It's like the guy who was looking for his glasses, looked everywhere around the house. Finally, he said to his wife, have you seen my glasses? She said, yes. They're sitting on your nose right now. He had them on his face. He didn't even recognize it. I think sometimes we're looking for something that we want desperately, and we already have that which we think we need. I vividly recall in my early Christian walk, during what was labeled by the press at the time, as the Jesus Movement. A clergyman in Southern California 
was ditzing the whole thing of the Jesus movement and saying, you know, there's a bunch of young kids and what do they know? And I remember a statement and it was written in the press. He said, and I'm quoting, after all, all they have, that would be us, is Jesus. Close quote. And I read that, and I pondered that, and I thought, he doesn't even realize what he's saying. All they have is Jesus. And Paul would say here, if all you have is Jesus, then you have it all. He is the center, and everything branches off from that. And I've been told throughout my Christian life by well-meaning people, individuals, and groups that I need more than Jesus. I had a guy in a robe I don't know why he dressed in a row, but he was very dramatic, and he came up to where I was living, and he told me that it's good that I was a Christian, but was I a vegetarian Christian? (laughs) And I said, no, I'm not a vegetarian Christian. I have nothing against it. I've tried it before an episode of my life. He said, well, you're not really following God's will unless you follow the dietary regulations and become a total vegetarian. He was fully into Jesus plus vegetables. Or I've had other groups say, well, it's good that you're a Christian and you teach the Bible and all that, but do you pray and fast like we do or like this group does? Because if you don't, you're never really complete. I'm not against prayer and fasting. Obviously, if the Holy Spirit is yielding or leading you to yield to that, but it's not like you must do that or you're not complete in Him. That's just nonsense. Okay. If you can remember where Ephesus was, or if not, you can locate it on a map at the back of your Bible. About a hundred miles inland from Ephesus, and I'm bringing up Ephesus because that was a very important headquarters for Paul. Do you remember how long he spent in Ephesus? Three Three years. You get a star for that. You don't even have to take the quiz on the internet. Three years. And... um, Because that was so important and so pivotal and so much happened, even with relation to what we're going to read tonight. About 100 miles inland and to the east was a valley called the Lycus Valley, very important in the ancient period of history where the trade routes would go through the Lycus Valley. And there were three cities in the Lycus Valley, Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea, the first and the third you've heard of. You've heard of Colossae because of this book, and you've heard of the letter or the postcard that Jesus wrote to the Laodiceans in the book of Revelation. These are three very important places. Paul never visited Colossae, but because he was at Ephesus, people from Colossae came to visit him while he was teaching for three years in Ephesus, and it would seem that the pastor of the church at Colossae was one of them. We'll be introduced to him in just a minute. Now, Colossae was on the trade routes. It was a meeting point for east and west. It was a place where goods, services, ideas came together and would travel. And because of that, weird ideas traveled as well. Weird ideologies, belief systems and religions from the western part of the Roman Empire, the eastern part of the Roman Empire, And sometimes they would come together and they would merge into a brand new religious system where you'd have bits of a belief system, bits of another, and they put it all together and make it sort of a hybrid belief system. That was going on in Colossae. It wasn't just Gnosticism, as some of you may have read. Well, Paul was writing a polemic letter against the Gnostics. Sort of, but sort of not. It was a syncretistic religious belief system, ideologies that borrowed from Jewish legalism as well as Gnostic mysticism and combined them. Now, I've said the word Gnostic on a few occasions in the Bible from 30,000 feet. Just a few notable things about what they believed in. Number one, they believed God was good. Number two, they believed everything material in the material world was evil. And because of that, Jesus Christ cannot have had a material or physical body, but he was an emanation from God. And here was their belief system. There was God. He's perfect. 
He would have nothing to do with the material world because it's evil. So an emanation went out from him and another emanation and another and another and hundreds and thousands of emanations. Eventually, there was an emanation that went out from that God that created the material world as we know it. All sorts of weird ideas. That was Gnosticism. But this particular religious system that Paul is addressing in Colossians, the four chapters of this book, had a few characteristics. Number one, it was ritualistic. That's why I said it had parts of Jewish legalism. There was the observation of certain days to worship, certain seasons to worship, certain regulations they had to keep. Number two, it was ascetic. What I mean by that is it was strict discipline, self-discipline. You can't do certain things if you want to attain a spiritual level, the highest spiritual level. And number three, it was mystic. There were groups of people that claimed to get visions from God, and God revealed this to me, and God spoke to me, and then they would give what they thought God gave to them, including that they had to worship angels, different spirits other than God himself. Because all this was happening in the Lycus Valley, in Colossae, in Hierapolis, in Laodicea. The pastor named Epaphras, he was the pastor of Colossae, takes a long journey from Colossae to Rome. Why Rome? Because Paul's in jail in Rome. And he tells him what's going on. Paul, you wouldn't believe what people are into. They're coming into the church. This is what they're teaching. So Paul goes, yep, heard about that before. Yep, I've seen that before. So as Epaphras downloads what's going on, Paul, around 62 AD, decides to pen a letter to the Colossian church. And Epaphras, the pastor, who was probably saved under Paul's ministry. Remember I said Paul never went to Colossae, but he stayed in Ephesus. So probably what happened is Epaphras came to Ephesus where Paul was teaching, heard the message, responded to the message, became not only a Christian but became a leader eventually, and a church sprung up around a home Bible study, presumably. And now there's problems. And so Paul writes the letter to address the issues. Now there's four chapters in this book. And there's four sections, if I'm going to outline the book for you, make it very easy. So I'm giving you now the flight plan for this evening. Here it is. Number one is the personal section. These are their introductory remarks. They're in every one of Paul's letters, right? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, or whoever's with him, unto the church at, I've heard about you, this is what I think about it, this is what I'm praying for. All of that is the personal section. That's the first part. That's chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 14. Second section of this in our flight plan is the doctrinal section. That's chapter 1, verse 15, all the way through the end of chapter 2. That's the doctrinal. Number 3, you probably are already guessing where I'm going, is the practical section, which is a pattern with Paul's writings, is it not? He would often get personal then he would get doctrinal, then he would get practical. So beginning in chapter 3, verse 1, to chapter 4, verse 6, is the practical issue. If these are truths, then this is how they should look in your lives as church members in Colossae. And the fourth section of the book is relational. And that's the rest of chapter 4. Verse 7 all the way to the end is relational. So you have personal doctrinal, practical, or ethical, or applicational, and then finally, relational. That's the flight plan for the book of Colossians. Let's look at the first section, or parts of the personal section. Chapter 1, I take you to verse 3, skipping the introductory remarks. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the theme of this book. The Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you have heard before in the word of the gospel or the word of the truth of the gospel which has come to you 
as it also is in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit. Whenever the true gospel message is preached, that will inevitably be the result. Fruit will happen. It will come. People will be affected by it. As it is also since in you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful servant or minister of Christ on your behalf. So there has been fruit in Colossae. But wherever there's fruit, there are fruit flies. Or as H.A. Ironside used to say, whenever you turn on the light, there will be bugs. And the light has shined in that dark region of the world. And because of that, you have bugs that are attracted, fruit flies that come to spoil the work of God. Now verses 9 through 14 is Paul's prayer for them, which if you've noticed in many of his letters so far, he'll begin with introductory remarks, and then he'll say, you know, I've been thinking about you lately, and and as I think about you, here's some of the specific things that I pray for you about. And they're all different in each letter, as also in this one. So in verse 9, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom. By the way, wisdom will be mentioned six times for a very particular reason. And spiritual understanding. So notice, he prays for knowledge, wisdom, spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Why does he use these terms sort of stacked together? Knowledge, wisdom, spiritual understanding, and then repeat those throughout the book. Simply because these were terms the Gnostics loved to use. In fact, they had a special word for their kind of knowledge. They called it super knowledge. Super knowledge. In the Greek, epinosko. Not just nosko, to know something, to be aware of something, but we have an epinosis. We have a superior, super knowledge above all the rest. And if you do certain things, if you keep certain regulations and rituals, you too can be initiated and enter into this super knowledge, this epinosis. So Paul says, you know what I'm praying for? That you will have a super knowledge of what God wants for your lives, a knowledge of God's will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, these terms that the Gnostics used, that Paul is, I wouldn't say borrowing from them, because I would say that the Gnostics took good, godly, biblical Christian terms and hijacked the terms. They're great terms. Wisdom, knowledge, spiritual understanding, great terms. But used by the devil through the Gnostics, they came to mean something else. Now, I've noticed something about some of the tactics of Satan. He loves to hijack Christian vocabulary. But he doesn't want to consult the Christian dictionary as to the meaning of those words. He'll give it a brand new meaning. And so society will even say words like born again, but not mean what the Bible means. Or spiritual enlightenment, but not mean what the Bible means. Or I've been saved, but not mean what the Bible means. So that's why it's very careful. Whenever you engage in conversation with anybody besides a believer in Christ, a worldly person, or for that matter, a cultist especially, I would say, learn to define your terms. And you will discover that the Jesus of the Mormon and the Jesus of the Jehovah Witness and the Jesus of, of any cultic group, though the name sounds identical to what we read in the Bible, get them to define Jesus and you'll find it's a very different meaning. So get them to define, what do you mean by Jesus? Well, exactly who was he in your view? And you'll discover their description of Jesus or salvation is different than the biblical definition. So don't be fooled by terms. Investigate the terms. These were terms used and hijacked by the Gnostics. 
Now, beginning in verse 15 is the second section, the doctrinal section of the book. This is the pinnacle of the book. This is the most important section of the book. Everything is derived from this. And because of that, I'll spend more time in this section tonight than any of the other sections in our time together. Jesus Christ's preeminence, or being the most important one, most important issue, was denied by Jewish legalists and the Gnostic mystics. And this was a religion, remember, that was a compilation of both of these. So Paul says in verse 15, he, that is Christ, is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible. I wish we had time to delve deeply. You know, this is one of the hardest things for me about the Bible from 30,000 feet is I look and I go, I want to just, wait, stop right here and go deeper. But I can't because we're trying to fly over it. And I want to have that plane land and start digging into the ground. And I can't do that. But you'll notice that there is a visible creation and an invisible creation, one that you can't see, i.e. spiritual beings, angels, and some of those angels who have defected and become demons. A very real world that's invisible as well as one that is visible. All things were created, notice, through him and for him. And he, Christ, is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. So you can understand and see by what we've just read is that Paul is giving Christ a way exalted position. And you can't overstate Christ and how important and how central he is. And so that becomes the most important part of this book. So let's look at a couple of items here. Notice Jesus is the image of the invisible God. What does that mean? The word is icon, which means a, a, a portrait or a picture, a copy or a, or a likeness. It's another way of saying Jesus Christ is the likeness visibly in his character and personality of the invisible God. That word, icon, was used way back in ancient Greek times. One Greek soldier wrote a little letter, and in the letter was a, a drawing of himself, a portrait that a fellow soldier made of him. And he sent this to his father and said, Father, I sent you a little icon, portrait of myself. Jesus is the icon of God. Now, I'm going to go into a hobby that, that I, I know, and I used to know uh, a lot more when it was in film, and that is photography. Now, photography today is all digital, right? Even our esteemed photographer who's taking photographs tonight has a digital camera. So film, it's like, film, what's that? You, know, you go buy film, it's sort of hard to find a lot of the film that you used to buy. But in photography pre-digital, when there was film and photographic film was produced, uh, by shining, uh, or, or the picture by shining light through the film and an enlarger onto paper, there was something called a latent image, okay? So when you expose the film, click, you take a picture, shutter opens up, light goes through, and you have a latent image on the film. It's invisible. If you were to take it out of the camera and look at it, you wouldn't see anything. You'd see gray. But it's there. Because the light has excited some of the silver bromide crystals that are on the face of that plastic, that film. It's invisible. But if you apply certain chemicals like a developer to it, it takes something invisible and makes it visible. And so you develop it and you develop the paper. Jesus Christ came and up to that point, God was invisible. He developed the picture so that people could look and go, that's what God is like. There is the image of God. There is the perfect picture and personality of God. 
So Paul starts there with the Colossian church. He's the image of the invisible God. Notice the firstborn over all creation. You know how many cults have used that little phrase in this verse for their own perverted reasons, saying, see, Jesus wasn't God. He was born first because it says he is the firstborn, and they love to use this incorrectly. Here's the problem, though. If you keep reading down about the verses that we've been looking at, notice it says he's the firstborn from among the dead. So does that mean Jesus Christ was the first who ever rose from the dead? Doesn't mean that. It can't mean that. If it does, he'd be wrong because even in Jesus' own ministry, he rose people from the dead, raised them from the dead before his own bodily resurrection. And in the Old Testament, people rose from the dead before the New Testament. So obviously, it doesn't mean first in time or chronology. It must mean something else, and it does. The word firstborn is a very common construction. The Greek word, prototokos, it means the most important. First in status or priority. And sometimes the nation of Israel was called the firstborn of God. Like in Exodus chapter 4, God said, you are my people, my firstborn. That is, you are the most important people group of all the people groups in this world. I'm dealing with you right now, and I'm bringing you into a land, and I'm giving you priority as to my own plans for the future. They're the firstborn. Here's another example. Remember Joseph? He had two sons while he was in Egypt. Remember their names? Firstborn, the guy who was born first, who came out of the womb first, was called Manasseh. The the secondborn son was Ephraim. Except... um, Uh, Later on, when Joseph brought his sons to his father Jacob to bless, remember what he did? He did one of these switcheroos. He crossed his hands, placed his right hand on the youngest son, left hand on the oldest son. And Joseph goes, Dad, you got it all wrong. He goes, Nope, I know exactly what I'm doing. And later on, when we get to Jeremiah, God uses this example. And he says of Ephraim, who was born chronologically second, is not Ephraim my firstborn. That is, he is in the place to receive the inheritance and the blessing. It's a way of saying he is the most important one, the one that I'm going to work through more so than the other one. So don't get thrown by the term firstborn that means born in uh, chronological order first. It means first in order of importance or priority. Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. That is, of all that exists, since he is the creator, it says here. He is the head of it. It originated from him, and he's the most important over everything else. And of all the people who have risen from the dead, he's the most important, the firstborn from among the dead. That's the idea of it. Look at also in verse 17, he's before all things. Do you understand this? He's before all things. Go as far back as you want to in history and put your peg there. And then, well, I can think of something further back than that and further back. and Wherever you put your peg, Jesus Christ will walk out of eternity and meet you there. He's before it all. He's the only one who existed before he was born. Before he was born in Bethlehem, he preexisted. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word is with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. That's Bethlehem, and dwelt among us. He's the only one who preexisted or lived before he was born. And then Paul says, in him all things consist. It means to be glued tightly together. Jesus Christ is the superglue of everything that is in creation. He holds it tightly together. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So Jesus is the source. He created everything, and he's the source of the church. The church was his idea. It wasn't a bunch of guys getting together going, you know what would be really cool? Now that Jesus is gone, 
Like if we just like kept this thing going, we'll call it a church. No, Jesus said, I will build my church. It was his idea to call men and women out and to bring them together throughout history. Notice that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Well, this makes sense. If he is the pre-existing one, as Paul said, if he is the creator, as Paul said, if he is the sustainer, as Paul just said, if he is the incarnate one to reveal or develop the personality of God in human flesh, and if he is the originator of the church, well, it only makes sense that he should occupy the most important place in your life and my life. That it shouldn't be angels or some other being or some ritual or regulation that we have Jesus plus something else. It just makes sense that if all of the fullness is in him, that all you need is him. Here's what Paul is getting at. Jesus Christ was no second-rate emanation, but the true revelation, the exact, full revelation of God the Father. So in chapter 2, verse 3, speaking of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Verse 8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Interesting thing about these teachers with this new spiritual identity, this mixture of Jewish legalism and Gnostic mysticism. What's interesting about them is they seemed to not go out and win converts from the pagan world, the Roman world, and bring them into their group. But they always attach themselves to already existing assemblies, churches. And their evangelism was, you need more than what you have. They couldn't sell their bill of goods to any kind of intellectual pagan because it's like, this is stupid. So they would find unsuspecting young believers who have always already opened the door to spirituality in their lives and start confusing them. And the ones who would fall prey the easiest were those who weren't rooted and grounded in truth. And they would, they would play, the false teachers would play upon a deep desire we all have. We all want to grow. We all want more than we've already experienced. We all want a deeper relationship with God. And so these teachers would say, well, I know that you do, therefore, we've got the system for you, and would drive them away. They tell them about the deeper life. You want a deeper life? Follow us and follow this system if you want a deeper life. And they got so deep, they went off the deep end. This is not uncommon This is very relevant, not just for today, but it will be relevant in the next generation if the Lord tarries. In every generation, this happens. I was reading a part of the autobiography of E. Stanley Jones, the great missionary who went to India. And he talked about his young ministry and how he attached himself to different people. He was 83 when he wrote what I'm about to read. And in looking back over his life, here's what that veteran missionary said. He said, Christ has been and is to me the event. In his light, I will try to see all of life. He writes that as a young evangelist, he saw the danger of becoming sidetracked. He says this, I once traveled during my formative evangelistic years with a very great man. I learned much from him. But when his emphasis shifted from Christ to various other emphases, anti-war programs, social justice, birth control, spiritualism, he was less than effective. He was a blur. He would exhaust these emphases in a year or two and have to shift to a new one. But you do not exhaust Christ. He is the inexhaustible one. Events come and go, but the event remains unchanged amid the unchangeable. So, 
Follow what Paul says in a brief few verses before we get to this next or third section. Verse 11. In him, in Christ, he's the center of this letter. In him, you were also circumcised. But notice, with the circumcision made without hands. Why would he say that? Because part of the people or part of the group was saying, hey, you know, I know you're a Christian, you believe in Jesus, but you must keep certain regulations, and one of them is circumcision. You've been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And then verse 12, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him. So this is what he's saying in verse 11. Every ceremony is completed in Christ. You can't add to Christ. It's not like you're saved by Christ plus baptism. You're not saved by Christ plus circumcision. You know, I don't know how they ever got very far with that one. And if you really want to get really spiritual, you've got to be circumcised. Uh, next. I don't know how anybody would be really appealing to that, but it must have got some people. You know what? Some folks are really obsessed with ceremony. To them, it's all about the beauty of the ceremony rather than what the ceremony means, what it's a symbol of. Well, if, it's a, if a ceremony or a ritual is symbolic of a greater reality, wouldn't it be better to find out what the greater reality is that it's speaking about instead of stopping short by just getting hung up on the symbolism of that which is greater? So it doesn't matter if it's circumcision or baptism or baby dedication or confirmation. These are all symbols of a greater reality. So what he's saying in verse 11, every ceremony is completed in Christ. Look down at verse 14. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now he's saying every requirement is depleted in Christ. Not only is every ceremony completed, but every requirement is depleted. He says that he's taken away the handwriting of requirements. Okay, here's what he means. The law pointed its finger at us and told us, you've blown it, haven't you? Thou shalt not, and you did. Thou shalt, and you didn't. So when you read the law, you can read just the Ten Commandments, or you can read the book of Deuteronomy, which is the re-emphasis of the law, or you can read all the first five books of Moses, but read them, and you'll discover that's the standard, and I haven't kept all of that righteous standard. I have fallen short. I have blown it. And here's why. It was meant to. It was meant to show you, you've blown it. You can't fix it on your own. Here's the words of Paul the Apostle. I would not have known sin except by the law. Now that we, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world guilty before God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous by observing the law. Rather, through the law, I become conscious of sin. So... I read the law. There's requirements. I fail to keep the requirements. It tells me I'm guilty. The law is, in effect, a handwriting of requirements that I have not kept. So Jesus comes and he dies on the cross and he takes away the charge that is against us, the failure, breaking of the law, and nails it, as it were, nails it to the cross. In ancient times, if you owed a debt, once you paid the debt, a public announcement was nailed up somewhere that announced to people that you have paid in full your debt. So you and I could never fulfill the debt of breaking the law. It was done and completed in Christ at the cross. One of the great songs we sing from time to time is, 
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Look at verse 15. Not only is every ceremony completed, not only is every requirement depleted, but now every enemy is defeated. Verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, that means that's the invisible creation, fallen angels, having disarmed them, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. At one time, Satan said of your life, he's mine, she's mine. Then Jesus died on the cross. And that was the point of victory that caused Satan in whatever life would turn to him and say, I trust in Christ to be broken. Whenever the Roman government would win a decisive battle, in prominent battles there would be a victory march where the spoils of war were... Prisoners, typically who were soldiers fighting on the opposite side, would be marched through the town as a public victory procession saying, we have won, they have lost, here's the spoils of war that we're entitled to. And that's the idea here. He's made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. It's what Paul meant in 2 Corinthians when he wrote, now thanks be to God who always leads us to triumph in Christ, and some modern translations say whoever he leads us in a triumphal procession in Christ. It's the idea of a public spectacle. So verse 16. So let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and the worship of angels intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. In other words, there are people who are saying, I have this revelation because God gave it to me in a vision or in a dream. It's directly from God. So if you disobey what I'm saying, you're disobeying God. Paul's saying, they made it up. They made it up. God gave us the full revelation in Christ. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. That's it. They're making this stuff up. So, food, drink, festival, new moon, Sabbath, verse 16. Notice he says they're a shadow, verse 17, of things to come. You know what a shadow is. It's not the substance Up here on the platform, I can hold up my hand. There's lights coming from different places, but there's a shadow of my hand. Or let's see, is there a shadow of me behind here? A little bit, there's a shadow. That's not the real thing. The shadow of my hand speaks of the reality that there's a hand, but it's only a wisp of the reality. It's only an indication of the reality. So if circumcision, new moon, Sabbath, rituals were all shadows of the reality, why were people hung up on the shadow rather than the reality? And they were making it all about the shadow, the baptism, the circumcision, the dedication, instead of Christ. And it brings a question up that I've wondered about. If Jesus Christ is truly all that you need, then why would anyone ever settle for anything less than him? Or why would somebody go to something more than him, Christ plus something? And I thought about that, and I can only come up with one answer based upon my observation of human nature. It's because mankind is incurably addicted to working for his own salvation. They just cannot trust that Christ is enough. It's got to be something more that I do to earn his favor. And I've seen it over and over again. They never mature because they never rest in grace and therefore appropriate what is theirs. Which takes us to the third section, which we're going to skim through. Chapters 3 and part of chapter 4 down to verse 6. This is the practical section. This is where Paul says, 
Colossians, now you need to become in experience what you already are in God's grace positionally. Live it out. So he changes here from correction and instruction to application. Very, very practical. And he starts out with an if-then proposition. If this is true, then that must follow. Verse 1, if you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Verse 5, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Verse 8, but now you yourselves are to put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man, that is not your dad, that is the old you before Christ. You put off the old man with his deeds. That's a it's summed up, all of this, in verse 8 and 10. Put off the old, put on the new. Stop doing certain things. Start doing other things, not to earn salvation. But because you are in grace already saved and therefore have the power to do it, not on your own but through him, you put off and you put on. Now look at verse 18. He gets very practical. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. The children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing in the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, but not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. You see how Paul thinks in this letter? Do you see what he does? I really want you to get this. He begins by exalting Jesus Christ as the creator and the sustainer of everything. He then exalts Christ as the head of the church. And he says, not only is he the head of creation, not only is he the Lord of the church, but he needs to be the Lord of the kitchen, the Lord of the living room, the Lord of the bedroom, the Lord of the boardroom, the Lord of all of your other relationships. If he is the preeminent one, and he is, then it ought to change our relationships beginning at home and on into the relationships of everyday life. Because as Howard Hendricks loved to say in his preaching, if your Christianity doesn't work at home, it doesn't work. And then he said, so don't export it. So if Christ is preeminent, and you get all theological, I know this and all that, let's argue about the kenosis. And he said, let me just see how you're living at home with your wife and your husband and your children and bond servants with their masters. He had to have first place in our families, first place in our marriages, first place in the workplace, first place in relationships, recreation, vacations, first place in what we listen to and what we look at when people are watching and when nobody is watching. First place. Keep your eye on Christ. That's the theme. Keep your eye on Christ. Jesus is the most important thing. So, Colossians, look at him. Keep your eye on him. Focus on him. Every day, Christ. When I used to help my father in the construction business, he was a builder, a real estate developer, and so he'd hire out me and his other three sons to do work that he could pay a lower wage to than the real carpenters. So we would do finish work and we'd work as a helper to some of the other carpenters. Well, in my observation and experience in working with carpenters, they get really good at hammering nails because they do it all day long. And I remember seeing carpenters put a nail down and seemingly take off their hand. That's what it seemed like to me and sort of look at it while it was balancing. And then with one hit, drive the nail all the way into the two-by-four. Now, it was faster than that, but I think it just, bam, bam. And I tried it. <laughs> and I asked them to teach me, and they just said, just try it, you'll get it. And I kept hitting my thumb. And I noticed they never hit their thumb. And, and so I asked an expert, what's the secret? He goes, you always hit what you're looking at. If you're looking at your thumb, you're going to hit it. And I was, because I thought, I don't want to hit that. I, I want to protect that. 
So I'm looking at what I want to protect, but I'm using a hammer in my right hand to drive a nail, and I always hit what I looked at. He was looking at the head of the nail and driving it perfect every time. I was looking at my thumb, and it was hit and miss, mostly miss rather than hit. Are you looking at Christ? Are you living your life looking at Christ? Or have you added some things to your Christianity? You're being digressed from the most important thing. What other thumbs are there that are holding up Christ that seem to get all the attention? That's his thought here. Now, let's close the book with the last several verses. This is the relational part. Now, there's 11 names in the rest of chapter 4. And if you've ever read Colossians, you, you may come to this part and just sort of skip it. You know, I don't, who, what do I care? I don't know these people. What's the big deal? Why are they so important? And, and if you're the kind to do that, then you've also discovered other sections of the Bible you've had to skip over as well. Like the whole 16th chapter of the book of Romans it's all a list of names. And one of the things Paul does from time to time is list associates, co-workers, that were very important to him. So if you read it and you go, so what? What's the big deal? If Paul heard you say that, he'd say, they're a big deal to me. They're my associates. They're helpers in the ministry. And here's the point I think Paul is making. Whenever you see anyone successful or visible in any endeavor, even ministry, but especially in ministry. Know that there's several people behind the scenes making it all happen. Charles Lindbergh, you know him, right? You've heard him. Question, who is his mechanic? He said, I don't know. It's not important. It was to him. Very, very important. So, we have that here as well. These are what we would call hidden saints. If you were to ask anybody in the first century church, they would know who they are. Paul certainly knew who they were. And so he writes about them. Verse 7, Tychicus. He calls him a beloved brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant of the Lord, who will tell you all the news about me. He's mentioned five times in the New Testament. Because he's mentioned he must have been important. He was. He joined with Paul on the third missionary journey. He was probably one of the guys from Colossae who traveled with Epaphras to listen to that new preacher in Ephesus named Paul and was converted and was affected. When Paul decided to go back to Jerusalem and everybody said, don't go, don't go, don't go, Paul chose seven people as part of that team and Tychicus was one of the traveling companions. Notice that Paul calls him here a faithful minister. I mean, a servant. He's always thinking about other people. He was the guy that while Epaphras carried the letter to the Colossians back to Colossae, Tychicus carried the Ephesian letter back to Ephesus. It was a pretty important and weighty ministry to Paul. Somebody once said, the greatest ability in the world is dependability. I can't tell you what it's like to have people around you that are dependable. And I, I realize that in any ministry, there's a visibility factor. People see my face or hear my voice because of radio, but everybody in this church knows that the reason things work and tick so well is because there's so many faithful servants of the Lord doing the work of the ministry behind the scene that keep it all going. It's true here. It was true in Paul's life. Billy Graham had T.W. Wilson and Grady Wilson. Martin Luther had Philip Melanchthon. Paul the Apostle had a whole list that he mentions in his letters. Verse 9, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, that is, he's a homeboy, he comes from your town. Homeboy in a New Testament sense. They will make known to you all things which are happening here. Now keep that name tucked in your brain, Onesimus, because he was a criminal. He was a runaway slave, and the owner was Philemon. And we get to the book of Philemon, it's all about Onesimus 
and Philemon and that relationship of love and forgiveness. You see, it seemed like Onesimus robbed his master, Philemon, and ran away to Rome because in Rome you can get lost in the crowd. You can start a new life, he thought. He must have met Paul. And Paul led him to Christ. And Paul said, you got to reconcile with that old owner of yours, Philemon. And so this is Onesimus, that slave, and we'll get more into him when we get into that book. Verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Remember Mark? He was the guy in the first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. But somewhere in the middle of the journey, he got homesick, got cold feet, he got scared. We don't know exactly, but he left the company of Paul and Barnabas. Well, later on when that was done and Barnabas said and Paul said, hey, let's go back over the area where we planted churches and strengthen those believers. Barnabas said, great, let's bring Mark with us. Paul goes, I'm not going to bring him. He's not dependable. He flaked out. Well, there was such a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas that they split company and two groups were formed. But toward the end of Paul's ministry, there must have been a reconciliation for the very last letter Paul ever writes, 2 Timothy. He talks about Mark and he says, Get Mark and bring him with you when you come to me, for he is useful to me for the ministry. I love the fact that there was a breakup, but that in time, and it must have been several years, there was a beautiful reconciliation of these two before Paul died. Verse 11, notice, and Jesus, that is not Jesus Christ, that is another Yeshua, a common name, who is called Justice. These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision, who are Jewish. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He was the pastor of their church, Epaphras. And Epaphras traveled all the way to Rome to have an audience with Paul to say, Paul, what do I do about this weird doctrine spreading through my church? And Paul gave him instruction and wrote a letter. And it was carried back by this faithful pastor. And notice one of the characteristics that Paul brings out about Epaphras wasn't his theology, but his neology. He was a prayer warrior. He labored faithfully for them in prayer. And Paul must have spent a lot of close time to notice the prayer habits of this spiritual soldier. Verse 13, for I bear him witness that he is a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Remember those three cities were together in the Lycus Valley. Luke, a beloved physician who wrote the Gospel of Luke, as well as the book of Acts, was a traveling companion and personal physician of Paul the Apostle. And Demas greet you. Now, all of these names are good examples except that last one that I read, Demas. He's mentioned three times in the New Testament. He was with Paul on his third trip. He was with Paul when Paul got arrested and Paul was persecuted. And something, we don't know exactly what happened. But it could be that in seeing the persecution, he said, I can't hang with this. I I didn't sign up to get hurt. I didn't sign up for people to not like me anymore. I didn't sign up for people to call names at me or to have my life threatened. So the last thing we hear of Demas is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the very last letter that Paul writes, he said, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. Here's a guy who had the veneer of a dedicated Christian while all the while loving the world and loving the things of this world and really tied to the value system of this world. And you couldn't tell at first, but when times got tough, it always happened when times get tough and there's persecution and an economic crisis and wars, etc., etc., Eventually, as that goes on and on and on, the wheat and the chaff are separated. And this is a sad testimony of Demas. 
And we conclude, verse 16, when this, uh, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Now, some would say, well, I wish we had that letter. That is a letter Paul wrote that we don't have. There's no letter to the Laodiceans in the New Testament. Most scholars believe that the letter to the Laodiceans was the letter to the Ephesians. And that the principal city in that region was Ephesus, so they got the letter first, but that whole region would share letters that Paul wrote because they believed his letters to be weighty, important, and scripture, Peter said. They were read publicly and then taken to another assembly and read publicly. They didn't have copy machines, and he couldn't email one here and email one there. So they would read it publicly, then they would exchange letters. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. This salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this book. Lord, thank you for the central message of this letter. The central message, Paul would say, is it's not about him. It's not about Christianity. It's not about the belief system. It's about Christ himself. And how a person is related to Christ. And Lord, this just clears so much up for us. Because we tend to get sidetracked. Or even when we witness, we sometimes tend to get sidetracked by making the issue everything but Christ himself. And I pray that as we're reminded to keep Christ as the center, or as Paul puts it, the preeminent one in all areas of life, from family to business, from work to recreation. That as Jesus is the center of our lives in this upcoming year, people would see it and see that we're different and we would live compelling lives, the kind that unbelievers just got to know more about because they're curious that somebody could live such a different manner. That's what you've called us to live, different lives, holy lives. I pray, Father, that as we do that, you'd be a rewarder of those who diligently seek you and a saver of those souls who are around us. Do your work, Lord, in us and through us, and thank you for hungry hearts who come out to hear the Bible being taught. Strengthen each one gathered here tonight you know the good, you know the bad, you know the issues struggling. Father, we pray that you'd bless and strengthen for your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen.